myself, I think, but I just wanted to mention I uh, have known the Aussie family for some time, or some of the Aussie family. David, uh, I didn't know until I met him through his book, but he uh, was a student at the University of Iowa. He was an engineering and tech, which he says skewed his, skewed his view on the world. I think it probably had a great deal to do with the influence on what goes into this book <laughs> and some of the logistics concerned. But um, I've heard him read a couple of times from this book and uh, found it extremely interesting. Basically, it's a, a fantasy, a fantasy or a fictional alternative history of 9-11 that's not based on any of the actual facts, but it elucidates I thought a lot of emotion and motivations that actually go into politics uh, and what drives a lot of uh, motivators. So um, uh, I, I can't recall now when Instruments of the State came out, but um, he's got copies here that uh, you can have, or if you want to make a donation to Veterans for Peace, that would be appreciated. And I also would plug his second book, which is not related, but it's called Invisible Hands, and it's another very sad book with some of the funniest depictions of horrible trips to Disneyland and religious services that, it, and I thought it was interesting because it makes Muslims sound just like Catholics or Baptists in terms of other <laughs> religious services when I was cracking up. So I recommend both of them, but I'll just turn this over to David and you can tell them the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Thanks, Holly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks for every, everyone for coming. I uh, didn't expect such a huge turnout, but uh, <laughs> I've, I've spoken in front of much smaller audiences. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, as Holly said, I, uh, I, I grew up, actually I grew up in Iowa, in, in Cedar Rapids, and I went to the University of Iowa for uh, uh, engineering college. That was in the early 80s. And uh, since then I've uh, relocated to California, uh, where all the fun is. And um, actually, um, you know, uh, Iowa's a great place, of course, we all know that. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you work in technology, uh, you know, Silicon Valley and these kind of places uh, tend to kind of a, be attractive. So I moved out to actually San Diego area if, uh, to work in the cell phone industry. And um, one thing, just kind of a preface to, to what I was going to talk about uh, later, one thing I discovered. Uh, in working in the commercial, uh, you know, uh, technology business, was that uh, just about every company ends up becoming military uh, in terms of the products and the the scope of things that they do eventually. And so that's one thing that kind of motivated me to uh, to become a writer. Also, is because um, you know you kind of feel like uh, well, you know, technology is a terrific field and that type of thing, but Ultimately, it gets funneled toward, you know, military aims. Just my personal op opinion, but um, anyway. So, as a writer, um, what I've been doing is uh, working on a series of novels. Uh, this is the first one. It was called Instruments of the State. I think it came out in 2007. Oh, I'm sorry, 2010. I started working on it in 2007. It took me about three years, but. Um, uh, what was going on at the time was uh, I worked in a, uh, in a semiconductor uh, company in Orange County, and uh, it started to get disillusioned. And, um, and at that time, also, the economy was turning down. As you recall, the, the, the mortgage crisis began about 2007. So um, I, I left work and decided I'm going <clears> to <throat> write this novel. And um, uh, since then, I've decided to put a couple more together. The, the second uh, edition is going to be called Oath of Vengeance. So I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, the third one I'm working on, I'm still outlining, it's called Untame the Dogs. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute as well. But um, these are all inspired by events that actually happened. Uh, so Instruments of the State was inspired by 9-11, uh, which uh, we all know a lot about. Um, So, so you know, we've, we, we've all heard of the War on Terror. The War on Terror kind of came out of, uh, maybe came to our conscious more, uh, um, more fully <clears throat> after 9-11. Um, uh, but the way the War on Terror is depicted on TV kind of caught my interest. You know, uh, the media... The media has a way of kind of running with these issues. And 9-11 um, was something that uh, 
I think uh, really changed our country. But the war on terror actually became, began in the late 70s, really, with, uh, with the overthrow of the Shah of Iran. Uh, that's when I think the war on terror actually began. And so, um, you know, uh, the way it's depicted in the media, uh, it never seemed genuine to me. And that was one of the things that motivated me to start this book. Uh, I kind of feel like there's something manufactured about the war on terror. Uh, I, I just get the impression that, uh, you know, um, it's just not being told to us the, the way I feel it is. And I, I grew up uh, as, I, I'm Arab American, my background is. And the stories that we've been told about people's motivation, you know, to attack America or uh, they hate our way of life, these kind of things, never seemed real to me. Uh, I, you know, I used to go to the mosque in Cedar Rapids and in Iowa City here in California when I moved there. And I've never met, uh, you know, a Muslim or an Arab who wanted to do harm to the American people. <laughs> that was something that, that's something that we're told uh, and, you know, that we have to watch out for and we have to be wary of. But in my experience, it just isn't true. And so, um, you know, I, I started thinking, what are the motivation, what, you know, what motivates the media and, I don't know, the government or these interest groups to, to promote these ideas? Uh, so that was another motivation for the book. And as I kind of put these things together in my head, I started to think that, well, you know, maybe the facts and uh, figures surrounding 9-11 weren't really as we were told. And, um, one interesting uh, book uh, that was out there at the time was called Blowback by Chalmers Johnson. I'm sure some of you have heard of him. Uh, so he wrote this book called Blowback. Anyway, the intro to Blowback, he, he said he and his colleagues had gotten together on 9-11 after the, the towers collapsed. You know, it was a pretty, pretty serious event, you know, if you're a person. He, he was a, uh, I don't know if he was a professor, but he was a, um, he was in foreign affairs and things like that. He might have worked for the government. And, but he's a well-known kind of um, pundit on foreign affairs. And so in his book, Blowback, on the introduction, he says him and his colleagues were trying to figure out who could have done this. You know, this is right after it happened. And so he said one of the groups they thought about was uh, the, so, some sort of Chilean um, um, insurgent group because on September 11th, I think it was 1973, the CIA overthrew the um, Chilean government, and in po I think uh, Pinochet was the guy that they that they uh, installed as a dictator over there. And he said, you know, a lot of other um, uh, nations or people around the world might have been motivated to do something like 9/11 and like the Japanese. Uh, we dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan, you know, 30 years or 40 years earlier. And um, uh, he also mentioned uh, the Koreans. You know, you don't hear a lot about it, but the U.S. military leveled North Korea d right after World War II. You know, so much so that there weren't any targets left to bomb. That is sort of the news we're hearing now, you know. I mean, North Korea is in the, the news a lot today. Um, but anyway, um, the way I saw the whole media presentation of 9-11 was it was sort of opportunistic. Um, on 9-11, uh, I remember what I was doing. I'm sure everybody does. I uh, went to work, and uh, later that day I was supposed to go to a trade show. So I watched the buildings collapse. And then we went down to San Diego, a, a work buddy and I, and uh, nobody was there. <laughs> it was kind of like... Well, we, we discovered, of course, all the planes had been grounded, but we thought it was kind of odd. But at the time, we were still kind of baffled. We were talking about it, but I kind of had a feeling in the back of my mind that by the time we got home that night, and it turned out to be the case that, you know, they'd start uh, mentioning Middle Eastern names and, and faces, and of course they did. And uh, uh, so... In the back of my mind, I kind of saw the whole, you know, Arab connection coming. And um, as the months passed, uh, they came up with the footage of 
Muhammad al Atta, I think we kind of all remember him. They showed him in the Portland, Maine airport boarding a flight for Boston. He was supposedly the ringleader of the whole thing. And then later on, they came up with um, video or audio recordings of people speaking Arabic in the cockpit. And these were the kind of things that they were putting together for us to, you know, create this image that this had to be a group of Arab terrorists. One thing to consider was that every terrorist in the, that was involved in this thing died on 9-11. <laughs> so, you know, it, there was really nothing left of, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of evidence to show it other than the images we were showing in the media. Uh, they also um, came up with a guy named Zachariah Musawi. He, um, he was cons called the 20th hijacker. Uh, supposedly, he had some sort of connection to some of the people that they identified on the flights. And they, they tried him. Uh, I believe it was a public trial. And the consensus was that he was basically kind of insane. Uh, he defended himself. And uh, he was, of course, found guilty. I believe he's in uh, the Supermax prison in Colorado today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, in my opinion, the whole 9-11 uh, thing was uh, a little bit contrived uh, in terms of what they've shown us so far, as far as who did it, why they did it, that kind of thing. They also put a 9-11 commission together, the government did on, in November of 2002. There were, I believe there were 10 people on the commission, five Republicans and five uh, Democrats. And uh, the 9-11 commission was basically staffed with American politicians. And the 9-11 report's really interesting. I don't know if anybody's actually s seen it or taken the time to read through it, but it's free. It's about that thick in terms of the book that you can actually, you can buy it, or I believe you can even get it free from the government. Um, but the 9-11 commission, what surprised me about it was that it, really didn't talk very much about 9-11. It talked more about the threats to America from radical Islamic terror. And it also uh, talked about America's uh, plan to confront radical Islamic terror. And it's actually, I, I, I mean, I'm not uh, advocating it, but it's a really interesting uh, document to go through. It's pretty thick, like I said, so it's hard to read it from cover to cover. But. Um, the first thing I noticed about it was there was hardly anything in it about the hijackers themselves. Um, it was, uh, I think, uh, Muhammad al Atta has about a half a page write up. It's all just the canned information we'd heard about him. He was disgruntled in Egypt. He moved to Germany, these kind of things. He got involved with Al Qaeda, that kind of stuff. So, and it, it's, it's just so superficial, it's hard to believe. But that's what kind of got me wondering, uh, you know, whether it was really legitimate or. Um, the whole war, what, what the whole war on terror was about. Um, uh, also, in terms of the war on terror, um, uh, you know, we tend to think of 9-11 as, as sort of a milestone, but we should also remember that uh, the Twin Towers were also attacked in 1993 um, by a truck bomb, uh, a group of operatives that parked a truck bomb, and I think in the third level down in the parking structure in uh, one of the towers. And they were, their attempt was to blow up uh, one of the support columns in the middle of the building. And they actually detonated the bomb. It, uh, it did do a lot of damage, but it didn't destabilize the building. But what was interesting about that was um, they were able to, the government, this is the FBI and, and ATF, they were able to uh, collect a lot of uh, debris from the, from the um, explosion. And um, from that debris, they had sifted through it. And their claim was that they had found a, a, a fragment of the axle that had a partial serial number on it. And from that fragment, they were able to trace back who made the truck, where the truck, uh, you know, uh, who owned the truck turned out to be a rental yard in, in New Jersey that uh, Ramsey bin Yusuf, uh, he, he was the ultimate culprit in that deal, that he had rented. And uh, the funny thing about that was that Ramsey bin Yusuf didn't have a valid driver's license. And so, but somehow he was able to rent this uh, truck and 
make a bomb and drive under the World Trade Tower and, and detonate it. Um, I thought that was kind of a curious uh, development. Um, I mentioned that uh, you know the, the the war on terror, in my opinion, really started with the overthrow of the Shah of Iran in 1979, and that's what brought kind of, in my opinion, radical Islamic terror to the forefront, to kind of to our consciousness. And uh, within 10 years, of course, the Soviet Union had had collapsed, and um, so I guess where this is all going is that what's the real motivation for? for this war on terror. And to me, the real motivation kind of boils down to a few different things. Uh, one of them is arms sales. Uh, without an enemy like the Soviet Union, uh, the, the arms manufacturers and the US military, you know, our military complex, needed a legitimate uh, enemy to deal with. And so, um, you know, that's where radical Islamic terror fits perfectly into the whole scheme. You know, and it's also a decentralized uh, type of uh, enemy, as we kind of know. So, so that was one, one angle. Um, um, after 9-11 after also, um, you know, this consciousness of radical Islamic terror was kind of, you know, in, in reinforced in the media. Uh, the thing about the media is, uh, you know, we, we tend to believe all this stuff. It's, uh, it's a pretty powerful tool. What it does is it kind of shrinks our world for us. You know, we, we tend to think that um, um, a, terror, a terror attack, wherever it may be, anywhere in the world or in New York or whatever, uh, somehow impacts our lives here in Iowa City or in San Diego. Uh, it may, the media just, the TV or the radio makes our world seem so small, you know, uh, ignoring the fact that we, there's seven billion people in the world and every day, everywhere, people are just going about their business. But somehow or other, this kind of captures our consciousness and it really works as a tool for for this uh, military uh, industry and this arms complex that that has benefited so so greatly from 9/11, and from this war on terror, you know. And since 9/11, there's been all kinds of various uh, attacks and things like that, uh, and and these so-called plots that the FBI have been intercepting, in Orange County, not far from where I live, um, I believe the mosque there had taken out a, a um, or opened up a, some sort of. Um, complaint with uh, the court system because the FBI had been infiltrating the mosque over there, uh, a couple of different mosques, in fact, and it has it, it become so prevalent that, you know, they basically had to go to the district attorney to seek help, and this is against the federal government, and I believe that's an ongoing case, and, um, you know, there, there have been these crazy schemes, like you might have heard of the Fort Dick Six, these were some uh, guys in uh, uh, New Jersey or New York, I think they were, one of them was a pizza delivery man and these kind of, uh, you know, they held kind of menial jobs, but the government accused them of trying to attack Fort Dix, which is a army base in New Jersey. And uh, there's been a number, there's been a series of these kind of things that, that have, uh, you know, been high profile in the media, but you start to wonder what, has anything ever really come about? and the one thing these all have in common is that the uh, FBI is always connected to, the, to these uh, so-called assailants. They're uh, ahead of time. Ahead of time, they, there's either an informant involved or uh, they're under surveillance. And in Instruments of the State, uh, that's kind of a main part of the plot is that uh, actually start with uh, the attack in, on the Twin Towers in uh, 1993. And, uh, you know, my feeling on that whole situation was that uh, Ramsey bin Yusuf and these guys, they were, they were involved with the FBI ahead of time. Some people call it entrapment, but um, at any rate, why is the FBI always, all, why do they always have these guys under surveillance, you know, and, uh, and then they claim later that they've intercepted a plot. So it's kind of interesting, it's just kind of coincidental to me. Um, Oh, 
so uh, in Instruments of the State, the, the premise of this book was that the Soviet Union uh, was disappearing in 1990. And, uh, you know, the, the arms in industry needed an enemy, as, as I mentioned. And um, uh, this is the system as we know it. You know, America has to have an external existential threat to our way of life to really uh, to keep going, you know, to keep our economy stable and, uh, I guess, to keep our society together. Uh, so what is this way of life that they keep talking about? I mean, we've all heard that term. And um, I've talked to people about it a lot, just kind of spontaneously out in public and these type of things. And when you talk to people about what our way of life is, uh, we, we uh, kind of feel like, well, we, you know, we're free. We have freedom of expression. We can go uh, to the mall whenever we want, these kind of things. But I've kind of come to the conclusion that the term our way of life as the media um, portrays it to us really has more to do with the system that we live in. And um, I think uh, it boils down to two things, uh, corporate profits and debt. Um, so uh, in America, our values are kind of set for us. And I don't mean to be preachy about that. I'm just telling you what I've kind of come to observe over the decades. And uh, the two most important things uh, from an economic point, point of view, maybe even from a social point of view, are uh, corporate profits and, and the way you know, the American people view borrowing money, so to speak. These are, these are, these are capitalist values. And um, the biggest threat to our way of life uh, turn out to be two things. One is socialism. We hear that a lot on the news. And the other is uh, Islam. And the reason I say that is because uh, uh, these two philosophies, uh, they, more than any, kind of aggressively stand for the rights of humans. And uh, I grew up in a, in a Muslim family, but I, I don't really, I, I don't consider myself religious and I don't promote the religion, you know, uh, you know the way uh, religious people promote religion. Uh, but, I, but I do believe that uh, just growing up in, in, in a Muslim household, uh, one of the things I did learn about Islam, for example, and you might have heard this too, is Islam, um, uh, for example, usury is, is outlawed in Islam. You're not really, as, as uh, in a Muslim society, encumbering people in debt and collecting high rates of interest are outlawed. And the reason is because it doesn't really, it, it, you know, it holds people back, it holds people down. And um, so from a humanistic point of view, we want people to, you know, to, uh, to grow and excel. And uh, so under socialism and under Islam, the human values are most important. But under a capitalistic way of life, humans become resources. And so uh, I had mentioned that the arms industry was sort of one of the motivations uh, that uh, you know, America's fighting a war on terror. But I think another motivation is this notion that um, capitalist values are under attack. Uh, so from both a socialistic point of view and an Islamic point of view, those are the enemies. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, from a capitalistic point of view, Islam and socialism are, are enemies to our values. And so when the media or when we hear our way of life is under attack, that's the way I see it now. You know, I, I see it as an attack on our values, on our corporate profits and our, our value that humans should be uh, encumbered by debt. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, that's more or less what I wanted to say. So just kind of in summary, uh, in Instruments of the State, in uh, this book, my first novel, uh, Islam was set up as sort of the fall guy for the attack, the, the, t the, the, the terrorist attacks on 
in um, my next book, which is called Oath of Vengeance, um, socialism is, is sort of set up as the fall guy, you know, and, and um, this notion that um, America's under attack and we need to deal with that. So what I thought I would do uh, is uh, just read a uh, chapter out of Oath of Vengeance and maybe you get kind of a, a sense of where that book is going. Uh, this is chapter 8 and in both Instruments of the State and Oath of Vengeance there's a sort of a group of, um, of, of puppet masters behind the scene. There's a, it's a group of five. You'd probably find, uh, find them to, to be familiar characters from, from real life. Uh, there's Donald, there's not Donald Rumsfeld. I'm giving it away. <laughs> there's uh, uh, one of the characters is named Robert Byram. He, sort of a corporate uh, bigwig. Uh, Sherman Chase is uh, the vice president of the United States. There's an admiral involved, a couple bankers. Uh, Isaac Boaz is, uh, is, is, is an Israeli uh, uh, who, who's part of this group as well. And these guys get together and you know, they talk about world affairs and what they need to do uh, you know, to deal with uh, uh, some of the threats to America and to Western capitalism. So I'm going to read from chapter 8 here. This is from Oath of Vengeance. Marcus Berg was growing nervous. You're kidding, Henry, he said. Tell me you're kidding. It's a legitimate inquiry, said Murphy, McMurphy. He looked around the table at his business associates. I mean, the bottom's going to fall out sooner or later. Why prolong the agony? Well, needless to say, the banks are our lifeblood, said Berg. We're not going to let them fail. Berg looked at the others with a hopeful grin. I mean, the Treasury has skin in the game, and the Fed does too. They'll come up with something. Spoken like a true believer, said Chase through the speakerphone. Okay, said Boaz. Let's say the banks do hit a rough patch. Let's say a couple of them even collapse. That doesn't mean things have to end badly. I mean, if we play our cards right, we'll cash in all over again. Like Marcus said, that's how the game is played. Kiko, you're missing the point, said Chase. Creative accounting is fun for a while or as fun while it lasts, and maybe the system can self-correct. But at some point, things get pushed too far, and at this stage, we can't afford to get sloppy. If the system is compromised, it could kill, them, kill us. We have to err on the side of caution. We need another plan of attack. Well, war is never a bad answer, McMurphy said. The only question is how many wars can we fight at one time? Defense is sucking off the same tit as everyone else. We're not talking about war either, Henry. War either, Henry, said Byram. That ship has sailed. We need to think along more strategic lines. We need to think about how to replace some of what's been taken. We need to figure out how to put some of it back. Bob's right, said Chase. We have to bite the bullet on this one, gentlemen. We have to get back to the basics. But war is the basics, said Boaz. Cheap labor and war. What else is there? I'd put it this way, said Chase. There's something even more fundamental than cheap labor and defense and fuzzy math. There's wealth in certain places, natural wealth, that's not being protected. I'm talking about strategic resources that could swing the balance back in our favor. And if we think creatively, acquiring them wouldn't take much effort at all. The room was silent as Chase, Chase's words sunk in. Sherman said, Berg, are you saying what I think you're saying? He leaned closer to the speakerphone. I'm saying that the war business has run its course, said Chase. It's a zero-sum game, at least for the time being. Our only hope is to get back to the business that got us here in the first place. The business that got us here in the first place, asked the Admiral. Yes, gentlemen, the business that put our great country on the map. Slavery, Boaz joked. No, Chase replied. I'm talking about the only, com I'm talking about the only commodity that matters in the end, energy. Energy, said Berg. Oil, if you prefer, said Chase. Perhaps it's a cliche, but oil is still the king of the heap. It's still the most valuable commodity the world has ever known. And it will remain so as long as humans rule the earth. It still backs our currency and it controls, and control of it gives us a strategic advantage over our adversaries. So if anyone's gotten foggy on the facts, please get unfoggy quick. While Chase was sitting, Robert Byram got up from his chair and lumbered past the portraits of the deformed children on the wall. He was headed for the wet bar at the front of the conference room. Well, we've already got the Iraqi supply sewn up, Sherman, said Berg. Curtel is booming. Plus, we've partner partnered with the major players in most other markets. 
Byram plunked an ice cube in a glass and reached for a bottle of scotch. Kurtel's been good, he said, pouring a shot of the yellow liquid, and some of the other projects too, but we need more, gentlemen, a lot more. I agree, friends, said Chase. We have to face the fact that the only way to add real value to the economy is to find that next pot of gold, that bucket of pure profit that's there for the taking. So now we're back to making money the old-fashioned way, said the Admiral. Stealing it? Why not, said Berg. After all, we're not communists. The others laughed, but Marcus Berg shifted uncomfortably in his chair. Come on, gentlemen, he said. If we talk about, if we're talking about oil, then we already have our bases covered. Even apart from Kurtel, Angola has been a gold mine and Azerbaijan has been playing ball. Berg looked around the room. Things are moving along nicely. Why mess with it? Marcus, you know these are all singles and doubles, said Byram. Well and good, of course, but we need home runs. We need another Saudi Arabia. Shit, we're trillions of dollars in the hole here. That's right, Marcus. Chase's tinny voice crept back through the speakerphone. With the national debt the way it is, the dollar could very well collapse. And if the dollar fails and housing f fails, the overall economy will collapse sooner than anyone expects. It's a risk I'm just not willing to take. Well, maybe we should take a lesson from the past, said Admiral McMurphy. Iraq and Afghanistan, for all their good intentions, weren't fully exploited. I mean, how did we get out of debt during the last major depression? Byram shook his head. Please don't start up with your World War II, II talk, Harry, or Henry, he said. But that's how we did it, Bob. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, they saved our bacon. The facts speak for themselves. Henry said, Chase, I know you're a military man, but it wasn't World War II that saved us. It was our factories. We were productive. Cheap labor, remember? But now there's manufacturing capacity all over the world, said Byram. American labor just isn't competitive, and we all know it. Well, maybe we need to take out some of that capacity then, McMurphy said. Byram looked sideways at the Admiral. Chase was getting impatient. Listen, guys, he said, we need to get down to brass tacks. Banking schemes and accounting tricks aren't going to carry us through, through this. Like I said before, the only large-scale profit sources for the foreseeable future are basic commodities. Oil, that is. It is and always will be the easiest way to spin hay into gold. We have the physical and financial infrastructure queued up and ready to go, said Byram. USA Incorporated is dependent on it, all of it. But that's just crazy, said Berg. The Russian oligarchs have gone down. The Shah of Iran has been out for decades, and even Brazil is starting to exert some independence. The world is a big place, gentlemen, and as great as America is, we don't have the power to control all of it. Maybe, Chase replied, but there are outliers, major outliers, that have been flying under the radar. Yes, Marcus, said Byram. Some, some will take time. Others we can engage immediately. Engage, said Berg. Yes, Byram answered, engage. But I thought we agreed that war is draining our resources, that it's a net loser. Right again, Marcus, said Byram. He coddled his drink as he walked toward a giant globe in the corner of the room. But if I had to pick my top three, he said, here's where I'd be looking. Byram turned the globe and pointed to a large green spot in South Asia. Iran, he said. He lifted his finger and spun the globe again, stopping this time over North Africa. Libya. Then Byram turned the globe one last time and stopped in a curious location. Lifting his hand, he put his big round finger on a sliver of land in a place no one would have imagined. And the winner is, he said, holding up his scotch glass, Norway. Norway, said the men at the table. Byram looked up with a squinty grin. Iran, Libya, and Norway, Boaz asked. I mean, I can see the first two, but Norway? Yes, Norway, Boaz, Boaz replied, our Scandinavian friends to the north. Why the surprise, gentlemen? Why the funny looks? They're a NATO member, said Admiral McMurphy. What, are we eating our young now? Yeah, Bob, said Berg. You know the agreement. An attack on one is an attack on all, so to speak. So to speak is right, Byram shot back. Listen, Norway controls the largest known oil reserves in the world with their North Sea holdings. It's the wealthiest nation on Earth per capita, wealthier than all of the Gulf states put together. And by God, they're going to play ball. It's that simple. Bob, said Berg, we're entering dangerous territory here. I'm not even comfortable talking about it, to be honest. I think, I suggest we think long and hard about taking such a path. Oh, bull roar, Marcus, Byram shouted. We're talking about the survival of our nation. I mean, why are these socialist fishmongers any better than the stinking Saudis? Admiral McMurphy and Isaac Boaz looked at one another in disbelief. Listen, gentlemen, said Chase, we all know that Iran will take some pr priming. As for Libya, We've had them on ice for years, and when the time comes, they'll be ready. 
But Norway is not out of the question. I mean, why overlook the obvious? And as Chase uttered these ominous words, Robert Byram stood beside the giant globe with a smug look on his face, knowing that in the end, he and the vice president would rule the day. We need to get back to basics, gentlemen, said Chase. Let's start thinking about our options. Uh, so that's uh, just a slice of the beginning of the novel, and basically it's setting up the idea that uh, there are no nations in the world that are outside of the scope of, uh, you know, the American and the coalition, uh, the, I guess, let's just say the influence of the American military and the coalition forces. And the premise of uh, Oath of Vengeance is that um, nations like Norway, for example, who we've always considered to be r allies, are not really allies. Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the empire needs those resources. And um, there's this uh, saying, I heard it on KPFK the other day, uh, arms dealers uh, don't have friends or enemies, they just have customers. So um, I'll, I'll just give away a little bit of the plot. The, uh, the nation of Norway is a very wealthy nation, very, very small population. There's only about six million people that live there. And, um, but they control a lot of wealth. Um, and one thing I didn't know until I uh, started working on Oath of Vengeance was that they barely have a military or, or a police uh, presence in their country. In fact, one of the opening scenes in Oath of Vengeance was a, a police chopper, chopper in Oslo, Norway, uh, hovering over this island that had come under attack from a, a, the terrorist attack that you probably heard of in 2012 from this, uh, this right-wing uh, um, activist guy. And um, what I found out was the city of Oslo didn't even have a police helicopter. So I had to kind of rework the scene to take out the police chopper. Um, but anyway, um, sort of the premise behind this book is that when you have a country with so much wealth, when you have so much wealth that's um, sort of there for the taking, a country like, uh, you know, a a, predator, a predatory economy, let's just say, needs that wealth and will take that wealth. So without going into much more detail, that's sort of the premise of, of Oath of Vengeance. Um, there's, a, there's a crew of characters that make this happen. Um, but I guess I'll save that for when I'm actually done with the book. I think I'll be done by the beginning of summer. So. I got I got to get this going because I've been working on this one for about three or four years too. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's that's sort of the the uh, that's a rundown of of, of that project, and uh, I hope uh, I hope I was coherent enough to kind of put it all together, just in terms of the war on terror and how I think it kind of fits together with uh, you know our arms industry and these kind of things. So. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, or if you want to chit-chat afterward, that's fine too. Oh, and as uh, Holly mentioned, I have some copies of Instruments of the State. They're free. If, if you don't have a copy, you're, you're welcome to it. If you'd like to make a donation to um, Veterans for Peace, uh, my dad runs the Lynn County chapter. And I don't know if you're familiar with Veterans for Peace, but they do pretty good work. So thanks again. and. Uh, 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 yeah, Robin. Uh, just a couple of comments, Dave. I was interested that you brought Norway into the discussion mm -hmm. recently that uh, Norway's sovereign wealth fund is divesting from petroleum stock to the tune of a trillion dollars. So they're sort of uh, moving increasingly in the direction of uh, uh, a greener sovereign wealth fund. The other thing, and maybe some of you all have seen this, uh, uh, a series that streams on either Netflix or Amazon called Occupied. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about uh, Norway that is about to uh, launch an alternative energy program powered by thorium. Hmm. And yeah. the EU moves in and says, no, you can't do that. You need to keep producing gas and oil uh, because we depend on it. And they said, in order to uh, help you uh, 
uh, reinvigorate your industry, the uh, Russians are going to come in and kind of help you guide that program. And so it's a, it's a wonderful uh, case study of how uh, society uh, uh, responds to occupation and mm -hmm. how, it, uh, how it deteriorates in so many ways, all the way down to personal relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, so it made me, and then I always think of the Israeli occupation of Palestine any time I think of an occupying force. But I recommend that series, Occupy. Occupied. Uh, it's, okay. it's gotten some notoriety uh, essentially because of the uh, uh, Democrats' insistence that we investigate the Russian tinkering with our political process. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, those two comments about uh, the situation of Norway. Yeah, I, I also, um, I saw a, uh, I don't know if it was on 60 Minutes, but Norway is, might be the first country that within the next couple of years is going to require that all cars be electric. So I, Norway's just an interesting case because um, all of their wealth is from oil. You know, uh, their North Sea uh, oil fields and a lot of that, you know, those type of uh, resources where, where this sovereign wealth fund came from. And I believe that sovereign wealth fund is, um, I believe it's the largest in the world I've, I've heard. Uh, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, every Norwegian is a, is a millionaire just based on this sovereign wealth fund that they have that uh, there's so much money in this this fund that every citizen of Norway <laughs> is, you know, has basically a million dollars in their retirement account. And, um, but there again, there's an irony there too, is that, uh, you know, as they're, as, as they're one of the leaders in the world toward green energy and electric cars and all the, all of their wealth had come from oil. But not only that, they're mili they had a very, they have a very small military presence and a very small security you know, intelligence presence, at least relative to like larger countries. So the the premise of Oath of Vengeance is that this is going to have to change. That one way to bring countries like Norway into the fold is that they too are going to have to build a security state. And oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, for Iran, why did you go back to 1953? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We have never had that here. And uh, you know, the propaganda is like 9-11, bombing New York is like bombing the whole nation. We know we figure it's one little piece. But, but it's that psychological thing. Mm -hmm. So that there's a, a, a lot of things that you have to know the history of it to know the present because, <clears throat> excuse me, no way was poor. I mean, Third war, mm -hmm. and it was once part of Russia. So that you got to know geography when you see different things going on. When you see like Russia, why is Russia in Syria? Because part of Russia has always been in the Middle East. And that's that there was a man that used to teach uh, film studies, Dr. Wheelwright. He said the Russians are more Eastern than they are, uh, Rus are European. Even the way they do their names how they say the whole family name and how important the family is. Mm -hmm. But that's how important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are good points. Um, Norway was a very, uh, well, let's just say they were a pretty poor country. Uh, they had been occupied for centuries, like by Sweden and Denmark and these countries. And, and then their, their, their kingdoms had come together. And, uh, but... Um, I mean, you know, here in Iowa, there's a lot of Norwegian immigrants from, uh, I suppose, going back to the 1800s, you know, there's even a city called Norway around here somewhere. And um, we were talking about Richard Wolff before, the, before I was talking. Uh, he, he does an economic update show on KPFK down in San Diego, but he's pretty well known. And anyway, he described the whole immigrant experiences 
you know, people going from poor countries to wealthy countries. So you know all these Norwegian immigrants from the, uh, 18, or, you know, the late 1800s that came to Iowa were basically just looking for a better place to live. The conditions in Norway were pretty difficult. Uh, so Norway was a poor country, and now it's literally the richest country in the world. Mm -hmm. We pay too much uh -oh. attention to Trump and not enough attention to Ben. Yeah. Ben said, guard your borders, uh, money into this and that. Mm -hmm. So you guard yourself from Mexico because that's your guard. You, you, you know, you leave Canada open and your money. Because, like, Canada to me, as a native American, is the most foreign country in the world. Because we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And when we Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, I think maybe that's true about all countries. I mean, growing up in America, you know, I, look, America's a, a great place. I felt like I got a good education, but in terms of knowing about the rest of the world, it's not something that, you know, we really promote here. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think there's kind of a reason for that, too. It, you know, it helps us focus on our own nationalism, uh, but sometimes it gets a little bit uh, out of control. Uh, like for Korea, I mentioned Korea earlier. Like uh, my impression of Korea was what I saw on MASH, the show MASH. That's, that's honestly, that's all I ever knew about the country of Korea was what I saw on the TV show MASH. And um, only lately did I, that I come to find out that in the Korean War, wasn't I mean within the last few years anyway, um, the American military literally flattened the whole country. There was like, by the end of the Korean War, there was nothing left to bomb. <laughs> this is, this is kind of the, uh, the way. Uh, this is what you find out when you do a little bit of checking on on that. Yeah, I've heard that too. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. But in the early times, we were shocked out there. He shows place after place. Iceland. Mm -hmm. Iceland was a country that was taking care of its people and everything. Mm -hmm. And you created an economic meltdown. Yeah. So anytime there's a, a situation, either a disaster or whatever, mm -hmm. that's where you do it all over the world. Yeah. And I mean, those are, um, those countries are. They're vulnerable, but they're ripe. Gre Greece is an example too. You know, these a lot of countries around the world that uh, we're doing okay economically. That's an opportunity for investment banks to to go in and start selling bonds and putting their retirement funds, uh, so-called, uh, you know, quote unquote, investing the funds. And and I kind of wonder about this Norwegian. Uh, uh, oil trust fund too. I mean, there's a lot of money there, <laughs> and I'm. I mean, I'm sure there, there are bright people handling it. But boy, that's that sure is a huge pot of wealth uh, that maybe could work, you know, for America's interests. <laughs> and and who better than, you know, our arms industry to t take advantage of that? So uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because. That, that is kind of the premise, is that, you know, when you have a huge amount of natural wealth or financial wealth somewhere, it's, that's the capitalist principle. It's there for the taking, I, I, I believe. And I, yeah, go ahead. And also, I mean, my, my was here to serve, and I was in Serbia, when they bombed us, and mm -hmm. I think they're over there now. Oh, okay. And I mean, so there was another country mm -hmm. that was functioning fine, and we caused that's what up. Mm -hmm. We could say we could make it out to be a um, religious thing, the boss and everything. So we created that so we could go in and exploit it. And then Soros brought up all the coast of all and the gold mines there and everything. Mm -hmm. So again, hmm. just go place by place. Mm -hmm. You create the 
tension, and then you go in, sell arms to one side, and let it all go, and then you take over. Mm-hmm. So. Uncle Bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like it's real. It Even, real. And what better than fiction to talk about reality? <laughs> but another country, too, that they've recently split up is South Sudan. And, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on that. Maybe my Uncle Bill knows more about it. But um, I, my understanding was that was all kind of related to splitting up the oil resources. And now... You know, and they were saying, oh, we're going to give the South Sudanese their freedom from these oppressive, you know, Arab, Northern Sudanese. But my understanding now is South Sudan is just a total disaster. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's a pattern. I mean, and if uh, it's not, it's, you know, it's not obvious, but if you start looking at it, it is sort of obvious. You know, like you're talking about splitting up Serbia, you know, splitting up Sudan, splitting up Indonesia. You know, divide and conquer is kind of the the uh, the idea. You know, behind this concept of capturing economic and natural wealth from countries around the world, and um, Anyway, I think it, it also makes for good, good stories, and uh, yeah.
20 years ago and say we have to help these people. Mm -hmm. The ones that were split, they abandoned us. The yes. And it's in worse shape to be. And it's ever been in the history of the soil that's in these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, that's sort of the uh, the theme of the, the talk, and thanks for, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, CIA, South America, South America, Venezuela, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Venezuela, Colombia, Venezuela, 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 Ven
deal was made that they would spy on him because of uh, what was the hooky down in the crooks out. And then Saudi Arabia comes down and bombing that place is poor. It's not really poor because they have one too. But what they're doing to those people doesn't make sense because the Saudis don't particularly care for them. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's why when they talk about these wars, you know, like, it's just a shame to say that Arabs don't particularly love them to each other. The Saudis don't like the Kuwaitis and the Kuwaitis don't like the Arab Egypt and all of them hate what, what that blanket of Islam that they're placing on just brings them all, all the Arabs together to make you a mix and by blanket of the um, radical Islam. And then the, the, the Standard Foundation came back again. They gave out books that Princeton report. And it, it was specific. They said, don't use the term radical Islam. That was one of the rules of the book. And what, how Obama was handling the war was what Princeton And, and the Arab people, just from my experience, tend to view themselves as kind of one, one nation. The whole division, the whole political division, really comes from colonization, from uh, you know the British and the French and uh, uh, and then the Americans, of course. Uh, you know, dividing up these nations into smaller and smaller pieces. You know, trying to you know, divide and conquer, like I mentioned. Oh, Robin had a comment. Did you have a comment, Robin? I was just thinking, so a lot of the reading that I've been doing in recent times uh, that suggests that the mainspring of American interventionism mm -hmm. and imperialism in the world is to maintain the dollar as the world reserve currency. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that, I've heard uh, that too. <laughs> two, ways, two ways that that works is that you move in on the country and you force them to take loans, uh, sort of like the mob, you know, forces you to take, uh, take loans. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is our trade deficit. That as long as the, we're the, as long as countries have to deal in dollars, then there's no place to go with dollars except to buy our bonds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and yeah, that's so, a good one. In a way, our trade deficit is financing our, our wars. Yeah, that that's what that's what China did, right? They we had a huge trade def deficit with them, and then we go ahead and finance that by selling them bonds. And I think they're the outside of our own social security system, they're the largest bondholder uh, in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Well, you know, the old saw is that uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's sort of uh, uh, the Chinese kind of the Chinese, the Japanese, and uh, a few others uh, really own us. Okay. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you heard a comment about Puerto Rico. Oh, Puerto Rico. Uh, oh well, you know that's a good question too. Uh, w you know when when those hurricanes hit Puerto Rico and wiped everything out, everybody knew the elect electrical system wasn't going to really survive. But in the states here, you know when that happens to Florida and Mississippi and North Carolina, immediately, I don't even think there's a time lapse. A, a um, you know the electric companies from other other areas are immediately mobilized and the grids back up you know very quickly I used to work for Iowa Electric when I first graduated from college and you know I I, kn I have a basic understanding of how the grid works and what they have to do to bring it back up and anywhere in the continental United States when the grid goes down there's agreements between all the electric companies the trucks are there the linemen are up and they're everything's done yeah yeah, yeah, it, it goes up right away. But Puerto Rico was a different story. And um, even though everybody's probably heard by now that Puerto Ricans are American citizens, and Puerto Rico is a <laughs> is a um, colony or not a it is a colony. <laughs> Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. Um, there. Their, their, their grid is still down. And in fact, I was listening today, they said, you know, they're, they're touting now that half of the electrical capacity is back up and running. But they said that's not distribution, that's just generation. In other words, they got some power, they got the water out of some of the power plants, but the lines are still down. People in the country still don't have electricity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that they can't, it's that... Well, the first thing... The first thing he said, as, as I recall, one of the first things I heard about Puerto Rico was Donald Trump says, well, they owe Wall Street a lot of money. And then the next thing I saw was Donald Trump uh, in Puerto Rico throwing rolls of paper towels and people are jumping up, grabbing them, and this was supposed to be, you know, some sort of PR gig. <laughs> Well, their island's been destroyed, so that maybe they're not much use to us anymore. I don't know. Well, I think that a lot of uh, medications are 30% of the pharmaceutical industry is, is pharmaceutical medications. Oh, headquartered in Puerto Rico? Okay. okay. You're working in a hospital right now, and you don't have drugs to uh -huh. your patients, and you're sitting in a sorry place. And oh, and really? Okay. The pressure is, huh. is 30% of the drugs. Are well, you, you know what I heard over the weekend was that Iowa State University basketball team I think it was Iowa State, won the Puerto Rican Invitational over the weekend. So are they, are they playing basketball over there now? How would you know there's no communication available? I just heard that on the radio. No, no, no. I mean, how would most of us know? Yeah. I mean, I can't talk to my family in Puerto Rico. Oh, you have family, yeah. I didn't know about the whole drug connection, but uh, I would think that'd be serious. You mean the factories or the? Of the drugs. Oh. Uh huh. Well, my neighbor is getting treatment for cancer, <laughs> and they were supposed to be uh, using a bag, uh, you know, drip things through the but they were injecting it through her stomach hmm. because they, the bags are made in Puerto Rico. Huh. Wow, that's interesting. Well, I would think that'd be a crisis. It, it is a crisis. That's the crisis. <laughs> 
Well, really? Wow. Them. I mean, there's a shortage. I'm a pharmacist. I'm retired. Thank God. I don't have to deal with it. But, but you know, again, the, those drugs are just not available because they can't get the manufacturing wow. up to speed. And I'm sure they're getting priority for generators and everything. Yeah, else. I was going to say they must have some fix for that because I couldn't imagine well, they'd let that. that mm-hmm. Well, they, that country, uh, or the company, there's a company called Whitefish, you probably heard, they were supposed, they had gotten the contract to, to rebuild the electrical system and then they, they claimed there was some sort of corrupt angle because it was no, there was no uh, bid on the whole, but anyway, apparently they had pulled out now. They said they're owed $83 million and they're not going to... Um, I don't know how much more they could have been shamed. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, anyway. Well, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Dad. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, every everybody has made the comment that Puerto Rico is really a colony of the U.S. You know, we, we call it a territory and we say the people are citizens, but but, but uh, they don't have representation in Congress, of course. But um, the comment's been made that Puerto Rico is basically just a colony. And I, all I can imagine is that now that that place has been wiped out and it's going to take a huge reinvestment, Congress or Donald Trump or whoever is saying, well, what's going to be our return on that investment? You know, because that's the way you look at a colony, right? Is that what's the return on this investment? Well, if it's too much, if it's not profitable, why rebuild the place? Let them. Let hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I hadn't even heard that. Mm, yeah, go ahead. I think it's part of our system. It's part of this whole capitalist system. It's like, where, where can we go find somewhere to profit from? And they don't care about the people. You know, the, the, that's why I, say, I said earlier, like, uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the true enemies of America are socialism and it's not countries or anything. It's just these, uh, these philosophies of, uh, that basically have people, that are people-centered philosophy versus profit-centered you know, and uh, I think that's what we're fighting. It's just the way it seems to me. You know, and, and Norway's always been this socialist sort of nation, you know, that pulled together because times were tough there. And boy, they seem to be a target now, from what I can tell. But anyway. Also a target of our Native Americans and lands. Like the, uh, f with this uh, pipeline. Yeah. Somebody said that pipeline sprung a leak recently, and yeah, the XL pipeline, yeah, dumped. A ton. You mean it's still leaking? Oh. Kind of like, 
whatever. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for coming, and uh, I appreciate. I thanks. I I I I learned more.